Chapter 4, Verbal Communication. First, we're going to talk about the nature of language. And let's dis discuss the difference between language and verbal communication. Language is the formal structure of words, sentences, what have you. It's, the, it's English, French, Spanish, German, Mandarin, African, any of those formal languages. That is the actual language. Verbal communication is the use of language to convey information. Language and the human ability to think. First, let's look, let's look at written language. And we'll go back to ancient Egypt and we'll talk about hieroglyphics. That is a symbolic language. There is a symbol for every word or thought that you want to use. So, if I want to convey a bit of information to somebody via written language using hieroglyphics, I have to either use the words that exist and try to explain what I'm talking about, or I have to create a hieroglyphic specifically for that thought. The problem is, is that if I do create the, the new symbol, then I have to tell people, explain to people what that symbol is. So if I created a phone that did not exist prior to this, there was nothing anywhere around like it, and I took this phone and I made this symbol for a phone, I would then have to take the phone around and say, this is a phone, this is what it does, this is all the things it does for it, this is the symbol for it, so when I send you this, you'll know I'm talking about the phone. Now, if we discuss written language as alphabetical and separate words instead of symbols, and then we have the ability to expand and explain to people without showing them the topic, we can expand in more detail of what we're talking about. Same thing applies in your thought process. We all think in a language of some form, whether it's English, French, Spanish, German, Portuguese, whatever. Our native language is typically what we think in. So, as we know more, as we have the words, we are able to think and process thoughts better. We are able to expand and communicate these thoughts with other people, which allows us to collaborate, which allows us to expand our knowledge base and expand the human knowledge base and ex build on our cognitive abilities and therefore become more intelligent or at least more learned. So language is definitely affects the ability of humans to think. It is rule governed or exception governed. As we know, the English language is there, it has all the rules, but there's an exception to every rule, like the I before C, I before E except after C. It's also symbolic. And George Carlin explained this. He was talking about, about thoughts being fluid motion or floating around in your head, and then they're kind of not really structured. They're there, but they're not. And then when you put them down into word, they become boink, this solid, static thing. Now this word, this sound, this whatever that we're talking about in language is only a symbol for what's in your head. As we talked about in chapter one, language is the code where thought is the message. This is what we're trying to say. This is the code we're using. So the language is symbolic in, in nature. It is quite literally a representation of something else. And I'm going to put both these two together because as we've talked earlier, culture and gender, gender is a co-culture. We've talked about this in the last one, talking about, the, about losing your khakis. So language is very much culturally based. We can speak English here. We can, they can speak English in Great Britain, New Zealand, whatever. We can speak English in the South. We can speak English in the Northeast, in the Northwest, out in the, out in the Southwest. But our dialects are different. Our slang is different. Even the meaning of same words can be different. So take English, American English versus British English. When you talk about a car and you talk about the boot of a car, well, we don't have a boot on our car. Well, we do. It's called a trunk. But so there's the difference. There's differences just in, in terminology and difference. And that also applies to gender. Gender is also a co-culture and it affects the ability, although it may not be as extreme as American English versus 
British English, female English versus male English can be different. Now I want to apologize in advance right here for this if you are afraid of clowns. I cannot remember the name for fear of clowns, but for some reason the book felt the need to include an image of a clown talking about the power of language when this is obviously nonverbal communications and it's there just to scare the bejesus out of those people that have problem with clowns. That being said, language is very powerful and it does have control. It influences our perception of others. When someone speaks to us, we tend to associate knowledge, education level, smartness, whatever, with how they speak. I've spent a lot of time working with non-English speaking people from Central America, uh, South America, Mexico, Belize, Ecuador, whatever, and talking with them. I remember having a conversation with a gentleman on the side of a mountain in a survey, and as I'm discussing with him, and I'm trying to remember, I have to keep conscious that we are speaking in his non-native language, and he speaks English a whole lot better than I spoke Spanish. He's not stupid by any sense of the word. In fact, this man was an engineer and very, very knowledgeable. And it was one of those things. So, But it does influence your perception of others. You hear this, you hear the broken English that comes from someone who doesn't speak English on a regular basis, and you jump to that, they're not educated. They can be very, very smart. They just don't speak English well. So it does influence our perception of others. It reflects our attitudes. As we are speaking, if we are in a, a poor, having a poor day, we may speak differently, we choose different words, we may cuss more, we may use different languages altogether. And without going into the nonverbals of tone and, and inflection and all those, just the word choices are affected by our attitudes. And <clears throat> not just ours, but others. And of course, we will respond accordingly. The next thing is that our language affects others' perception of us. I am originally from the Northwest. We joke out there and say we don't have a we don't have an accent. It comes from our inability to pronounce the words of the towns that we lived in. If we had a Southern drawl, you come down here in the South. We speak slower. Southerners, I'm I'm learning to speak slower, but Southerners tend to speak slower than than Northerners. New England speaks a much faster cadence, much shorter spans between words between sentences, whereas the Southerner, and I've got a friend of mine that is very Southern speaking, and he talks real slow, and it takes him almost twice as long to get out what he's trying to say versus what I'm saying, and yet I know this man to be very intelligent and able to communicate these words very well. He just does it at a much slower space, a much slower pace, with much more emphasis on various terms and whatnot. Now, that being said, there is this perception that Southerners are not smart. If you go up to New York, New England, you go out actually pretty much most other areas of the country and you hear someone speaks with a Southern drawl, they automatically associate that with a dumb hillbilly. We all know that's not true, but that's that stereotype that goes on. But anyway, so how you speak, how you enunciate, how you talk, what words you choose, all of this affects how people perceive you. Now, one of the things we need to talk about <clears throat> is your choice of words. Certain words or certain collections of words tend to cause problems. And figure 4.2 from the book and also here on this slide will show, it says, and I'll take the first one, it says, I'm not surprised that you lied to me again. Well, if someone tells me that, I'm going to go on defensive. Now, it says, I want to trust you, so please tell me the truth, even though you think it's not what I want to hear. You shifted it from a you statement to an I statement. By, say, by, by wrapping this around me and making it about me, not about you, 
you're less likely to become defensive. It's not foolproof, but it does reduce some of it. Here, the, towards the end, it says, if you really want to lose weight, you would. Yeah, that's going to make me mad. You tell me that, that's going to piss me off. Now, you say, I envy those people who find losing weight an easy task. Yeah, I don't envy them. I, I, I hate them. But that's beside the point. Um, the point is, is that how you structure your terminology, how you structure your words, moving from you statements to I statements, don't, you know, shifting from blaming the person to blaming the act. Those kind of things change how people hear you and will change your response to you. It's also a good thing we will cover further when we talk about mediation and conflict. Now, here are some of the obstacles to effective verbal encoding. Insufficient vocabulary. Let's face it. If you can't get the words out, you can't assign a word to your thought, you can't encode it, and it's not going to happen. So, not having enough words in your head, not having the language to speak makes a difference. Back to pulling this. We have our, our native language. Now, what if I'm trying to speak in Spanish and I've taken Spanish one and two? I have a very narrow vocabulary. I'm going to find it very difficult to communicate. Next is jargon. Jargon is just simply words that are associated with a certain group or a certain, certain profession or whatever. The military uses acronyms a lot, FUBAR, AFU, all those um, surveyors have their own, not, double knot, balls, whatever. That means zero, by the way. Um, doctors, lawyers, all of that have their own jargon. These, these are terms that are specific to them, and you might as well be speaking a second language. Euphemisms are another situation. A euphemism is quite literally a word or phrase that represents some other word or phrase. There is a, t a local radio station that broadcasts obituaries on a regular basis. And they will come back and they'll say, well, so-and-so's gone home. Because I know it's obituaries, I know that he's saying, the dude died. And we used that a lot in death. Passed on, moved on, gone to a better place, gone home. Sex is the same thing. You know, we've got Netflix and chill, getting busy, doing it. We have all these various euphemisms that are used. The problem is that sometimes euphemisms that we're using are not ones that someone else understands. If we we're in a conversation, I said, well, Bob went home. And I didn't specifically say he had cancer and died. You probably wouldn't catch on that he died. I trigger words. Now, those are words that are specifically elicit some kind of emotional response. It can be some of the, the obvious ones that are out there. And without going into it, it, it can be the, the derogatory words or whatever. It can be that I'm fat. Well, fat may make me mad if someone says I'm fat. So you have the I'm big boned, which is actually a euphemism. Or you have gravitationally challenged. All of these are situations that are trigger words that can irk people and drive people nuts. Some of them are, are open and we know and we expect them and we know that's what's going to come out. Others not so much. We, we don't know how people are going to react until you use them. Abstracting and allness are two different kinds of ideas. Abstracting is pulling bits and pieces of, of, of a person's personality or situation and then calling it that person that because of it. Where allness is taking a single act and saying that's the person. So by saying I'm happy and cheerful, you all come out and say he's a happy person because I saw he was cheerful that day. I'm just cheerful because I put on a happy face because that's me and I need to be presenting a certain characteristic. characteristic. That is the idea of abstracting and allness. And then we have polarizing terms. And these are the all or nothing kind of, the ones or zeros, the on or off, the not, instead of looking at the spectrum from one to zero, we're looking at just one or zero. And it can be something as, as innocuous as saying the, liberal versus conservative. Most of us are not extremists on either end. We're somewhere in between. But those polarizing terms, you're a liberal, tends to cause problems. It can also be a trigger word. And then we have imprecise language and relative terms. Relative terms are the notion of something relative to something else. 
Um, when I was working in a sawmill, the old man that worked the forklift out there, if you asked him a question of where something was, the response was over yonder. It wasn't, it's over yonder, it's over yonder. It was with no a deflection of, or no indication of direction, over yonder. Everything was over yonder. Well, I don't know where yonder is to go over. So that is a very relative term. It's also imprecise language. But the whole point is, is that, you know, in a bit, relative, I'll be there in a bit, or we'll do it after a while, or it's due later. <clears throat> All these are imprecise language or terms. Another thing with imprecise language is the idea of um, humor. This is one that gets used quite a bit, is then that's sarcasm. We all say we're sarcastic, which is ironic humor. However, sarcasm actually is ironic humor implied to, to hurt or cause harm. Most of us are not actually trying to hurt somebody. We're just trying to be funny. We're not trying to do that. We are using ironic humor, but we're not trying to do it to be mean or hateful. That means that we are actually facetious. We're not, we're not sarcastic. We're facetious. That is the imprecise language being used. Now, how do you overcome some of these? Well, first off, expanding a poor vocabulary, read. Read a lot. Look up words you don't know. Look through the dictionary. Get you a word a day calendar. Something. Just expand the words. When you come across words you don't know, look them up. Try not to use jargon. It's fine to use jargon in a group that's there. In the debate team, they talk about flowing. They talk about, you know, this is our flow. Well, what it actually is is an outline, and it's their notes on their outline. It, it flows from one page to the next to the next, and that's why they call it flow. But if you're talking with someone that doesn't know what that is, you're not going to have a clue. So avoid that. Euphemisms, another situation. Be very clear about what it is that you're trying to say. If you're going to use a euphemism for sex, be sure that people, the person you say that knows that it's a euphemism for sex. If you're talking about somebody, you're going to go do some, going to go hook up with somebody to talk about Netflix and chill, you better make sure they know what you're talking about. Are you going to go kick back, watch Netflix and veg, or are you going to go have sex? Pay attention to trigger words. As I said before, there are some of them that stand out. We know them. They're there. They exist. Then there's others that are just, you have to watch for responses. Pay attention to those to make sure that that doesn't become a problem. Dating and indexing, be, be cautious. Make sure that you know what you're talking about, how it is, where it is. Don't say over yonder if you mean two miles to the right and then on there on the left, two feet to the side of the old barn. Or, you know, I'm going to be there at 3.30, not in a while. So index, be careful about those. Be cautious of extremes. One of the situations you run into is when you talk about an extreme and you say, this always happens, or this never happens. As soon as you say that always or never, people like me automatically default to trying to find out what that always or never is and then find exceptions to it. So avoid those extremes. Avoid saying that they're, they're a liberal or they are conservative or they're way left or way right. Be clear for me. On a side note, if you're taking a, a test and it has true or false questions if it has always or never in the statement it's probably false in defining and describing with care be very careful about how you define and describe things make sure that you are transmitting the information you mean and you're explaining what you want the way you want it not that you are trying to um write a dictionary in the process of writing or saying this, but use words and be very careful and make sure that the descriptions match what you're trying to say.